Hi, I'm Eric, Redbird Orchard. This is uh, 2020 and we're in the middle of harvest. Um, these are three of our ciders from last year. So from the 2019 harvest, which was a, a really big crop for us, big, big harvest, um, pretty good fruit. And uh, the ciders are kind of really coming into their own right now. So it's a really good time to taste through these and, and you know, and uh, pick them apart and talk about them. So um, we are a small five acre orchard. Uh, we have um, two different sites that are within 10 miles of each other in, in the Finger Lakes here. And um, we <laughs> specialize in uh, sustainable apple growing. Uh, we love low input ag. We're biodynamic uh, orchard. We're certified biodynamic by Demeter. And these three ciders are 100% certified, which is a new thing for us, which we're very excited about. We're happy to be part of that community, and um, they're they're really they're really three different blends of different types of apples or different categories of apples. That's sort of the best way to really generalize. Um, for me, we have over 150 apples in our apple varieties in our orchard. So there's there's a ton of um, potential is really the term that as a cider maker that that that's what it translates to it, it's potential so as as apple growers there's there's years we have a lot of fruit there's years that we have very small amounts of fruit and some varieties tend to be biennial so we have a big crop one year and a small crop the next year so when you have a, an orchard with a lot of varieties you tend to have completely inconsistent harvests, meaning that you don't have anywhere near the exact same consistency or blend of varieties. And how do you deal with that? Well, one way to deal with that is that you're not concerned really of pure consistency. And you also, in having 150 different apple varieties in the orchard, you have this ability to take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that, take a little bit of this, and come together to this place that is Star Blossom. And next year, you don't have those same components, but you have different components, and you are still able to come to the same place. So that's sort of the, the goal every year is to take what you have and bring it to where you want it to be. That's the artistic side of cider making. So you're, you're really... Um, for me, Star Blossom, Cloud Splitter, North Star are three very different ciders with three very different stylistic goals. And it's not like we can't accomplish those goals with whatever the season brings. We take what the season brings and we do our best to accomplish those goals. So, so that's kind of the, the philosophy. That's the theory. Um, that's how I approach cider making. And so, so they're different. Um, how are they different? Well, Star Blossom is um, a lot of heirlooms, which is sort of a general term, but it basically means um, apple varieties that were, I guess, maybe bred for eating or baking or processing purposes, not necessarily specifically for cider making. So they are like Northern Spy, Roxbury Russet, Golden Russet, um, Baldwin, Newtown Pippin, they're all heirloom apples or American antique varieties. And they, and, and the antique varieties have a certain character to them. And it's really, um, it's almost like, it's interesting, uh, the, the, the varieties that are bred and are very popular in the market today have a certain character. The apples that were popular in 1900 have a certain character and that character is whatever the popular culture wanted. So in the heirloom or antique varieties, they are sort of a um, kind of a historical record of what the popular culture wanted back then. And it just so happens that the popular culture in that time wanted um, storability 
um, they wanted acid and kind of um, the ability to make pies, sauce, um, put them in a root cellar, which really didn't have any, you know, modern cooling capabilities and have apples they could eat in March, April, and May. So from a cider making standpoint, those apples have a certain character. And generally speaking, they're a little bit more acidic than the common apples today. They have um, interesting aroma characteristics and, and, they, um, and they have a unique, I mean, maybe antique flavor. So that's a big piece of Star Blossom is, is sort of those, those varieties from that time period. And so a big part of Star Blossom is that. The other thing with Star Blossom is that we like, we like the herbaceous, the bittersweet, the earthy, um, the European barnyard flavor to a degree. So that is accomplished by growing some European apple varieties like Somerset Red Streak, Dabinet, um, Nehu Domains, which are both French. And, and so the history of a lot of the cider apple growing in Europe goes way back hundreds of years. And so in Europe, they grew apples specifically for making hard cider and they tended to have some tannic structure. And that's really important because in a cider, um, if you don't have tannins, it's just, um, it's lacking in, in structure or, um, or like body. It, if it doesn't have tannins, it can be just insipid or just too um, boring is kind of a term. So, so the tannin, the tannins in apples adds to structure, and that's really important. That was important to the Europeans when they developed their cider apples, and we in uh, North America and in the Finger Lakes today find that important because um, a lot of the American heirlooms don't have that. So um, we grow all these different apples here, and so a lot of these European, French, Spanish. Um, specific cider apple varieties are important in making the star blossom blend. And so here we go. Here it is. Um, this is, like I said, from 2019. It's, I like to think pure raw. It's, it's um, simply, simply stated the fruit has been blended at the press. I think we did, yeah, we did two different pressings of Star Blossom last year in October and November, and they were both um, blends of many different apples in each of those two pressings. And in the end, when we looked at it and made the blending trials, we realized that together they were perfect. So, so it's two different pressings of the same mindset, the heirloom base, and the bittersweet addition component. So those, those two types of apples went together in the grinder. They were pressed together. The juice dripped out of the press. We racked it into a stainless steel and a little bit of oak barrel for the star blossom. Went through fermentation, aged for a few months, settled for a few months, and then very simply transferred into a bright tank and forced carbonated. Bottled, done, simple. Never filtered, never fined. Um, minimal sulfites with the biodynamic certification. Um, not only do we grow biodynamically, but we only add natural ingredients to the processing. So um, I like to think it's, it's just raw, it's pure. So very simple, beautiful color. got this incredible woodsy herbaceous it's almost like if you if you're out with your kid in the woods and you're um, looking under rocks and, and logs for salamanders you may um, you might you may get a scent when you lift a partially rotted log and that scent is this earthiness right that's the earthiness that that I get in the star blossom along with you know a lot of like um, you know how herbs like basil and tarragon, thyme, they're very um, 
potent and um, um, really kind of um, strong, but very um, direct. They're not um, the the aromas of a lot of herbs to me is like is like really is is poignant. So to me, I get a lot of that kind of herbaceous. Herbaceous. I can't really pull, pull out a specific herb, but it's it's got that character. Along with, and this is this this is kind of the artistic thing, right? So we've got that herbaceousness, that earthiness, which is one characteristic. But what do we need to build on that? We need aroma. We need fruit and floral, and that's that's what you get from the Newtown Pippin and the Baldwin, the Tompkins King, the Sweet Sixteen. I didn't mention that earlier. That's Debatable to be an heirloom because I think it was bred in the 80s, but um, very aromatic variety. So that's the star blossom. A little bit of oak barrel fermentation and aging, but generally speaking, mostly stainless. And then, as I said, so, uh, force carbonated. really smooth. Not a ton of acid, not a lot of tannins. It's just um, well integrated. And it's young, 2019. So that that cider, I feel like I feel like all three of these ciders have a lot of aging potential because of the acid and tannin um, component from the apples. But um, they're really good right now. They're fresh. So what do we pair this with? Um, I mean, most cider really, really pairs well with cheeses in our family. We love the brie and the olives and the, um, baguette. That is like the perfect pairing for most ciders, most dry ciders. Um, it also, this cider also pairs really, really well with any kind of spicy Thai dish, um, curry. We pair cider with, with lamb stew, um, which may not seem quite appropriate, but it, it really, it really, it really hits the spot. So the star blossom again, floral, fruity, but it's got a focus of that of that earthy herbaceous character. And, and like I said earlier, it comes from the knowledge of the apples and kind of, of making that transition to the cider. Love that. So the vernal cloud splitter, how is it different? The only difference is the varieties used. So um, same orchard, same fermentation techniques, although there's no oak barrel in the cloud splitter, it's all stainless. Um, but, the, but the apple varieties are totally different. And so with the cloud splitter, it's, it, there's a few varieties that every year tend to fall into cloud splitter. Porter's Perfection, Wixing Crab, Kingston Black, Ashmead's Kernel, um, some of the wild apples that we've discovered over the years in the hedgerows and, and wild forests around us have made it into this cider every year. The gnarled Chapman, the Barnhill Sharp, the Redbird Bitter. They're um, exactly what, to me, is Cloud Splitter. And so um, Cloud Splitter, also it's important to have that aroma and floral and heirloom quality. And we get that from Tompkins King and Baldwin and Newtown Pippin, Rhode Island Greening, um, Ash Meets Colonel, Golden Russet, always. Um, but instead of the strict bittersweets that fall into the Star Blossom, we tend to add bitter sharps. Bitter sharps are apples that not only have that bitter tannic quality, they also have some sharp quality. So they're in a lot of regards from cider makers, they're the, the full spectrum, they have everything. And, and in, in cider making, if you're gonna make a single varietal cider, you want an apple that is a bitter sharp because it has 
the tannins and the acid. And a few bitter sharps are Kingston Black, Porter's Perfection, uh, Stoke Red. Um, Barnhill sharp. So those are those are bitter sharps. And so uh, Cloud Splitter has bitter sharps. It also has bitter sweets. It also has heirlooms. It also has some crab apples. It's a very um, uh, full circle cider. It's got a lot of different, a lot of the apple characteristics and varieties in it. Um, so it is a little bit less earthy and herbaceous, a little more sharp, a little darker color, a little richer, and that's probably primarily from the Kingston Black, um, the brown snout that's in this. Um, it's got some red fleshed apples in it too, which could add to that color. Uh, Rubiette, Mountain Rose, um, Grenadine, so you can smell it right off the bat. It's got <clears throat> a little more citrus, um, ruby red grapefruit, orange pith, um, tart cherry. It has the classic beeswax, which is sort of um, in both of these ciders. I feel like any, any, uh, European bittersweet apple or bitter sharp apple lends that beeswax um, quality character, which is a great, I think it's a really um, fantastic uh, component. The other thing is um, eucalyptus, you know, mint possibly. Um, terpenes, right? If you're, if you're a wine person, uh, terpenes are the, the the polyphenol compound that has that mint or eucalyptus, Gewürztraminer has a lot of terpenes. So, uh, vernal cloud splitter, a little bit sharper. It actually has, well, it perceives to have more tannins than the star blossom, although I've never done the analysis, but I would assume it's pretty similar. But when you have tannins associated with acid, the tannins are perceived to be harsher. So it's almost like, um, so in star blossom, the tannins along with lower acid allows the tannins to kind of just be tannins. When you throw in in any kind of malic acid into that, it just accentuates the, um, the feel, the dryness in your mouth. So it perceives as having a little more tannins, especially in the back of the throat. Um, but there's like this juicy um, acid richness in the front and then this really kind of fruity overlay. So it's, it's um, well-rounded. It's, it's complex, but it is, it is um, full circle. It's got a lot of the different components um, to make a great cider. So that's the Vernal Cloud Splitter. Um, again, same thing. We did two different pressings in October and November of a blend of all these awesome apples. Um, some other stuff that I didn't mention, Harry Masters Jersey, Bramley Seedling, Zabraga, um, Madai Dior, Yal Inta Mill, um, and, and all these other just crazy, I mean, you know, kind of in a way, um, <laughs> we're apple collectors, so we have all these rare varieties that we get from, you know, there's a guy out in California that sent me a bunch of Budwood a few years back, and he claimed to be um, he claimed to have access to one of the famous apple breeders, Albert Etter, who bred the famous Wixen crab um, in the 50s in California. Um, his Albert Etter's private uh, nursery is, is kind of this lure. It was almost forgotten in time and abandoned. And there's, there's some literature that talks about a lot of these old varieties that Albert Etter had um, bred and they just 
were lost. But apparently um, this, this guy that I ran across, I think through the Cider Digest, um, sent me some rare budwood from Albert Edder's lost abandoned nursery. And so they're in the orchard and we get the fruit and it goes into the cloud splitter. I don't even know exactly what it really is, but you know, to me, that's, that's fun. So, so like I was saying, our orchard is really kind of a library. It's a collection. And along with um, crazy stories like that, we are always looking for random wild fruit out in the wild and we graft them into the orchard and they, they make their way into these ciders. So, so um, we're trying to, the bottom line is we're trying to improve the um, productivity and production of flavor concentrated fruit with minimal inputs. Meaning we wanna like, like the ideal situation is we plant the trees, we walk away for four years and we come back and we harvest the fruit. And that hasn't happened yet, but I do feel like we're getting close. There's certain varieties that you really can um, neglect and they still um, thrive in this climate, which is, um, is a good thing. So vertical cloud splitter is um, all that stuff. It's all those interesting novels. And here it is, it tastes, I love it. This is what I drink all the time. Oh, and this is Gnarl Chapman, which was <clears throat> a seedling tree out near our, where our cidery is in Schuyler County in Burdette. And so that seedling tree grew up in the wild next to an abandoned orchard. And I was fortunate enough to discover that tree in uh, like 2005 or six or somewhere back there. And we saved it, we grafted it. We've got hundreds of trees in the orchard and the mother tree has been um, bulldozed. So the only um, Merle Chapmans that exist are, are here and various other places all over the country um, thanks to many nurseries who have propagated and bred it. And it really is an awesome cider apple. It's very disease resistant. It has tannins, it's big, which is a huge um, benefit to harvest efficiency and um, flavors are, are fantastic. So um, um, we're lucky to have discovered that. As are, as, you know, there's many people all over the country that are doing this and and I think it's really important because like I said, if we can, if we can improve our orchards, not only for cider, but for fresh fruit, if we can improve our orchards so that we have less need to spray anything, you know, even organic sulfur and copper, we're in a better place. So we need to, we need to save and preserve the genetics of food producing plants that are easy to grow. So North Star, the third cider, this is, um, this is still, so these two were carbonated. This is still, it's, um, you'll notice it's a little bit lighter in color and that's really because the tannins in the varieties used in the Star Blossom and Cloud Splitter, they oxidize and they, and they, um, they turn a darker shade, whereas the uh, North American heirlooms tend to stay a little more uh, yellow or bright in color. So the North Star, the, uh, the name North Star kind of fits with our, you know, naming pattern, but the North in it is a reference to North American or North American cider or North American heirloom varieties. So this cider is 100% North American bred or, or discovered in North American variety, in North America variety. So we have Newtown Pippin, Baldwin, Golden Russet, Keepsake, Liberty, Black Oxford, Arkansas Black, and Roxbury Russet. And that's actually, this is the first time I've actually thought of this. That, that kind of, um, aside from the West Coast, which would be fun to include that next time, Newtown Pippin is New Jersey. Baldwin is New York, Golden Russet is New York, Keepsake is Minnesota, Liberty is New York, 
Black Oxford is Maine. Arkansas Black is Arkansas. Roxbury Russet is Connecticut, or is it Rhode Island? I think it's Connecticut. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. That's kind of fun. Um, so they're all they're all apples that were um, either grew from a seedling or were bred in this general area. Well, not Arkansas, but but anyway, they're North American, so it's fun. So this this is those apples we picked these late this was the last these are the last apples we picked last year last year was an awesome harvest it was really busy we got a lot of fruit and the very the last 100 150 bushels was this and you know they were all just late in the season they were ripe full of sugar and we sweated them in the cidery for about a month month and a half um, they went through a few freezes, which was a little stressful. Um, our cidery is not, the, at least the room where we sweat apples, where the cider press is, it's not heated. So they just sat out. And I think we had a few nights in the upper teens in um, mid-December. And I was worried about it, but they, they made it through. And we pressed them. And here it is. So they sweated for a while in cold temperatures and um we pressed it and made this this great cider so we were going to blend this it was kind of originally at least my mindset at the time was it, it'll it'll make its way into the cloud splitter or the star blossom or maybe the workman dry but it was really unique and it it stood by itself as an excellent cider so we didn't blend it we just we kept it as as it is and we bottle it still and actually, we bottled um, a portion of it as as sparkling that we'll release maybe later this year, early next year. So that's exciting. So this is still um, super fruity. If if you're if you're accustomed to relating nose or aroma with flavor. Um, to me, the North Star, the nose is just, it's, it's all about the fruit. So you don't have the herbaceous character of the Star Blossom or that sort of uh, ruby red grapefruit, uh, orange pith nose of the Cloud Splitter. It's more fruity. So, so when you smell this, you're thinking, you're thinking soft, right? It's like, it's fruit. And it's almost tropical. It's almost um, it's almost passion fruit or guava. So it's really it's really soft. And it holds true. There's no tannins. <clears throat> there is tannins, but there's not that smoky, bittersweet beeswax tannin. And um, it's more like fruity juicy viscous it's got some it's got some weight to it it's interesting um the difference that a carbonated cider how it elevates the aroma and how it kind of activates you know it prickles your mouth and the the still cider is really it's more mild it's more subtle but the fruit is really, um, is there, it's apparent. So for me, the North Star in its even more so raw state without the carbonation is, um, is even more impressive. The fact that it, that it kind of highlights the fruit and the aroma and the floral the rose petal, uh, the wildflower um, characteristics in cider. So that's that's great. That's unique. And the problem here is we don't have any food. <laughs> so um, so we need to have some cheese and some baguette, um, maybe a meal, because dry ciders are supposed to be accompanied with delicious food. So I'm going to I'm going to go dive into some food right now and um, I hope you will too. OK, 
Okay, making the biodynamic compost pile. Um, just spent some time piling up um, a winter's worth of sheep bedding, manure, hay, and then we got the pile built. So now we're going to prep the pile with um, six different biodynamic preparations, 502 through 507. So the pile is generally in this fashion. We're going to go 502, 503, 504, 505, 506, 507. 502. This is the Yarrow preparation. These are, these are all plant materials that were packed into different organs or animal parts, skulls, um, mesenteries, whatever. And they basically form, again, a specific energy, a specific um, influence that we want this compost pile to collect. And in the end, we're going to have something that's going to be perfect for our orchard. So we're making a hole here for the 502, the RO. There's the RO. Put it in there. 503. This is the chamomile, Here. This is stinging nettle. Five oh five. Is the oak bark. Six dandelion and then the five oh seven is the valerian and the valerian is you press the flowers so we get a liquid and I've got it in this bucket over here I stirred this for 10 minutes in the normal biodynamic fashion with the vortexes and alternate directions so we're going to pour half of this 507 into this hole, into the compost. Now I'm just gonna close these holes up. Kind of seal in the preparation. It'll stay moist. Um, And as this pile composts, there'll be influences by these preparations within the pile. So the last thing is we take what's left of the 507 and we just throw it 
over the whole pile. You could do this with a sprayer. And what does valerian do? I'll show you that in one second. Got a little cheat sheet. So I've got more in there that I need to spread on that pile, but for the sake of time, so I have this. Valerian is used actually for a few reasons. It, it can uh, aid in spring frost damage in the spring. This is this is some information about each of the preparations. And kind of how they influence the pile. This is from Josephine Porter Institute. Um, so that that's about it. In the spring, we will spread this in the orchard. It'll it'll just kind of stay stagnant. We're not going to stir it. We're not going to worry about it um, really getting too wet or too dry. It's perfect climate here. We're just going to let it go. And then in the spring, we'll we'll put it in the orchard, um, and it'll add. It, it'll be a harmonious compost addition to the orchard. Okay. So here we are. Um, we're going to do the biodynamic 500 um, stirring and application to Redbird Orchard. Um, first, first piece of information is today is September 17th, 2020. So it's the new moon today, new moon in Virgo today. Um, the Stella Natura calendar, can we pan in on that? is confirming that uh, on the 17th, we've got a new moon. And because of that, it's a good day to think about the roots. And so the Biodynamic 500 application is about the roots and the soil. So it's a really good day to apply BD 500. The other thing is we're really close to the equinox on the 22nd. So it's a good time to think about, you know, the bringing into the ground. So this is a useful piece of information for biodynamic agriculture. Okay, so what we've got here is the BD500. So this is manure that had been packed into a cow horn last year and buried under the ground for a full year. And basically what this embodies is energy, um, not only from the cosmos, but from the earth, um, sort of funneled into the horn while it spent time underground, concentrated. Um, so this, this substance, which is compost, holds the energy that is important in creating balance and harmony in soil. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it into this four gallons of water, which is from the well here. So it's water from this place. Um, and we're going to stir it for about an hour. Although sometimes I do it a little less than an hour, to be honest. Um, I feel like in biodynamic agriculture, it is um, encouraged to follow your intuition. So if you're stirring, and you've been stirring for 40 minutes and you feel like it's time, there you go. You don't have to keep going. So follow your intuition. I think also the calendar can be used like it is today, but also if you follow your intuition, you'll generally know the right time to do the right tasks. So <clears throat> we're going to put this into the water. And then we're just going to stir it. Um, and when I, when I'm stirring, 
I'm really kind of thinking about a few things. The energy that's in that compost is now enveloping the water. The water is also, in a way, I feel being purified in this stirring process. We're kind of um, giving the water molecules the opportunity to um, become more of what that compost was, what that preparation was. By creating a deep vortex like this, I like to imagine that the energy, the influences from the cosmos are being funneled into the water. And so when I stir, I like to be in a quiet place. I never have my cell phone on me. I like to think about the soil, the tree roots, and how they interact with the diversity of microbiology. Okay, so I stirred the BD500, and um, I didn't mention earlier, but that was a portion that was the size of five acres. It was five units, so for five acres. So we're going to treat the five acre orchard today. Um, I broke, after I stirred it, after I energized the BD500 in solution, I split it in half and diluted it. So now what I have is a, a 2.5 unit portion diluted, ready to be spread. Um, and um, the, uh, the other thing that I'll just say right now, so this is energized. And we, we, can, we can talk about energy or forces. Um, we, all, we all understand gravity. We all understand the influence that the full moon has on tides. Um, this is energized with an energy force that is of the earth right so this this is going to harmonize um the orchard or this piece of land and so this is the downward this is the energizing of the soil the next application the next video of the bg501 the horn silica is the energizing of the above ground the foliage, the trees, the air around us. So it's sort of like the two sides interplaying. So right now we're energizing the soil. This is very simple. I've got a brush and we're just, we're just throwing it. Um, we got some apple trees, we got some raspberries here. Uh, we're trying to get it on the soil and the Thing to remember is that each droplet it's not about the physical nature we're not we're not trying to coat the leaves with an antifungal mechanism we're not trying to fertilize the soil but we're spreading the energy all right so this is the um, BD501, biodynamic 501, which is the horn silica. So silica clay is packed into a cow horn and buried in the ground. Um, and then it is, it is dug out and we get this powder. It's very dry uh, silica. Um, you store this in a glass container in a windowsill so that it is continuously in light and, uh, and um, that keeps it energized. And again, like the 500, the horn manure is for the downward or the earth or the microbiology in the soil. The 501 is for the upward 
for the leaves, for the foliage, for photosynthesis, um, for the above ground portion of the plant, harmonizing those energies. So um, today is September 22nd, which happens to be the equinox. Um, it is a leaf day. So we're going to spray the five, we're going to apply the 501 on this, this day. Um, and so a couple days earlier in the previous video on the 17th, which was the new moon, we did the 500 on a root day. Um, the other thing I didn't mention last time is that the root, the, the 500 application is, um, it's a little more beneficial to apply it in the evening and the 501 in the morning of the first half of the day. The other thing I didn't mention before is that in the orchard setting, at least my practice is we do a, a spring application of the 500 and the 501 a few days later, which tends to be in early May. It's, it's usually when things are awakening, the ground has thawed, snow is gone. Um, you can, you know, the, 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 the soil temperature is rising and there's activity that's usually around around here, it's in May. So we do that in the spring. We do the 500 and the 501. And then I try to do another application in around the solstice of the 500 and the 501. And then another application in the fall around the equinox of the 500 and the 501. So it's three different applications of these two, this duality of energy. So that's the, the approach that we do here at Redbird Orchard. Um, and then within that, we um, apply the 508, the biodynamic 508 equisetum tea um, throughout the growing season to kind of aid with uh, leaf um, strength and stability against diseases. Okay, so the 501 is this horn silica, dry powder, and we will this is this is three units so this holds enough for three acres uh, we're gonna add it to this water here which again is water from the, the the well on the property rinse that out a little bit so there we go we've got the horn silica in the water same technique where we're stirring in alternate directions. Deep vortex. Uh, with the 500, with the horn manure, I mentioned that I typically am thinking about the soil microbiology and the, you know, interactions with tree roots and the fungal environment and with the 500 you're kind of thinking about the sun and photosynthesis you're thinking about the leaves and the above ground activities in the orchard Again, it's a very meditative process. You find a quiet place to sit and just uh, enjoy the rhythm. To me, biodynamic agriculture is a key ingredient in low input agriculture. It um, assists in the management of growing crops. It adds diversity and plant resilience. It adds nutrition to food and it brings a sustainable environment to our earth. 
think for me, um, I was actually torn about us becoming certified biodynamic. There is a lot uh, about Rudolf Steiner that doesn't sit well with me um, in particular. And I know that some practitioners of biodynamics really kind of uh, look to him as a man ahead of his times. Um, but for me, my, my father was a theosophical society member and pretty involved with a lot of uh, Steiner things. I was raised as a young kid in the Waldorf school. Um, but when you look further at a lot of his lectures, um, especially his lecture on color, uh, it's, it's definitely not a man ahead of his times. It's actually not even a man where he should have been for his times. And, and some of his theories really, uh, I don't know if they caused harm, but they're definitely like the, his theory of color, I, I can't have in my house. Um, and so that, that puts you in a spot where it, it feels pretty crazy to, um, to get so much from the practice of biodynamics and to, to have it sit quite right because to me, to be environmentally sustainable, you have to have, you know, you have to be socially just and have it be racially equitable, all of those things. And it, it's hard when the founder of biodynamics, for me, doesn't represent those things at all. Um, it got a little bit like easier and rounder looking at um, the conference last year, I think they did a, the association or whoever put it on, did a, did a pretty good job at really making uh, social justice and racial equity the focus of the conference. And that was, that was great to see and to hear. Um, and I don't know if there's research out there or anyone's looking at, you know, the, the wide picture of things, but in my mind, you know, Rudolf Steiner was a, a vast traveler and he, he met people from all over. And in all of his lectures, I think it, it's often presented as, you know, divine knowledge that came down to him from on high. I could be way off, and maybe I'm way off, um, but I definitely feel like that that's what it's talked about a lot in like biodynamic circles. And I don't really buy that. Um, it, it, to me, my, my sense, especially from practicing biodynamics all these years, is that this information comes from his conversations with, with, with people, with peasant farmers, with indigenous people. Um, he, I, I, and it would make sense that none of that would be attributed to any of those people, because that's kind of a reflection of being a, a, a man of, of those times, um, and even of these times. So, you know, I, I don't have anything backing up what I'm saying or how I, those, that idea. Um, but that's kind of the only way for me that I, that I can have all of this sit in the same spaces as everything else inside of myself practicing agriculture the way we do and um, and making any kind of statement about it specifically being biodynamic and especially being certified biodynamic um, that those like I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, that I don't know I don't think you would even call it duality but to acknowledge that uh, dissonance and um, and it's a really important Kind of the, the journey we're on here um, and and I it, yeah I, I think those it, it's something worth really investigating um, and and being honest about um, I also you know there's a part of me too that loves biodynamics because it connects me with my father who passed away when I was really young so I think you know, we all, we all have those things that we try to like,
suss out and and navigate and figure out the the right or the most just path to take. And so we try to do a lot at Redbird um, counterbalancing those questions or those concerns with um, participating in in the fight for uh, social and racial justice. Um, and so we hope that all of you, especially if you're involved in ag or whatever you're involved in, can kind of find a way to bring all of that together um, because that's the way we will create the most sustainable world and the most sustainable agriculture. Cheers. Thanks. Cider Week Finger Lakes is brought to you by the New York Cider Association and is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors.